Hey everyone, it's Matt Carl at Leroy Heritage Museum, and uh, today I am up on the hillside uh, behind the hotel, and uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of the town, and I've been wanting to do this for a little bit of time now, but uh, usually the weather's not good or uh, something's going on, so I'm busy. But uh, today's a nice, bright, clear day, and so I decided to uh, see what we can do. So from up here you can get a pretty good view of the town. I'm using a tripod today that's uh, kind of a cheap one, so it probably will make some noise, but that's the way it is. So we'll come back to the center here. And uh, so we're looking at downtown Leroy, Pennsylvania. And uh, right straight ahead is the hotel building. And then to the left of that is Mill Street. So we'll focus in down here for a minute. So Leroy was started uh, in 1795 when Hugh and Sterling Holcomb, who were brothers, came to this area following Indian trails from Ulster into this area, which was a wilderness. So when you look out over this valley, there's a lot of the valley that's cleared now, and uh, not so much up on the uh, mountainside there, but... Uh, if you imagine that this valley was total wilderness at that time and that there was nothing here at all and uh, today as we stand here we hear machinery, farm machinery, lawnmowers and things down below but it would have been a silent wilderness other than uh, the, the birds that you would hear and whatnot but uh, this is the the place where these two brothers came, and these two brothers were uh, literally teenagers. One of them was in their early 20s, one of them still a teenager. And they came here to this area and settled. Now today, where the intersection of Route 414 and Mill Street is, this was referred to in the very early 1800s, late 1700s, early 1800s, this was referred to as Holcomb's Corners because this is where the Holcomb family settled. So if you look down here, this is the, the center of the community. The house that is uh, shown there, kind of in the foreground, we're looking at the back of it, that house is um, a replacement. There was actually a, a different house there uh, back in the early 1800s, and if you look, it's right next to where the hotel building is. So right there to the left of the hotel building, there was a large two-story house that was built there, and that is where Hugh Holcomb would later build his house. Now, there's a creek that runs into Leroy. Um, it's usually referred to in the old records as the Gulf Brook, and it was right up the Gulf Brook that Hugh Holcomb had his sawmill. And so, in fact, to my left is the creek um, beyond this tree right here off into that uh, hedgerow uh, is Gulf Brook, and that runs up through. And Hugh Holcomb built his sawmill right along that, that uh, creek. So he also had a grist mill in the center of town as well, and I believe that was down by the Tawanda Creek, down uh, kind of on the left of the screen, or in the right of the screen, I should say, where later on uh, others had grist mills and sawmills, Rancy Morse being one of them, but uh, Hugh Holcomb started down there in the early days. And so from the sawmill that he had up here along the Gulf Brook, he was able to build his house, and he was able to saw lumber. Uh, beginning, I think it was in 1808, for a lot of the houses that were being built in the early days. Most of those houses were called story-and-a-half houses. They were Connecticut-style, 
which means they're one story with a half upstairs, which means the upstairs is tucked into the uh, angle of the roof. And there are a couple of those houses around still today. Uh, many uh, have been torn down, but um, you can uh, still get an, an idea when you travel around and in this area and you see houses that are like that. Probably those houses were built by early settlers or either that or their children because that is the building style that these people knew when they came here and most of them came from the Connecticut area. Um, so that is how downtown Leroy began and um, this house that Hugh Holcomb lived in in later years down here it uh, survived and then um, it uh, seems to appear up until somewhere in the 1880s era and uh, 1890s maybe and um, then it seems to have been torn down after that um, it was abandoned in its later years um, you can see uh, the picture of the house uh, shown in the background of a school photo that was taken down in the middle of town in that era and you can see the house is dilapidated the sidings falling off and so on and um, so the house eventually was torn down and then the house there in the left of the photo in the foreground was later built by Dr. Wilcox in the 1880s and uh, Dr. Wilcox lived there with his family and uh, uh, he had a large farm. Um, there was a barn out behind that house. Um, uh, Bob Peter's house is there now, but there was a barn there. That barn was later torn down and is, was used um, by Vaughn Jennings uh, just, down, just down the road here to add an addition onto his barn on, on the Jennings farm many years ago and so that barn still exists as an addition to that farm currently and uh, when that this Dr. Wilcox's farm was in operation this land that we're standing on now was actually part of Dr. Wilcox's farm uh, it did not go with the hotel the uh, hotel sat on its own lot which is pretty much the the area that we mow um, right now was the hotel area was the land owned by the hotel and the Holcombs owned it and uh, because the Holcombs had a hotel in that location originally but everything else on the hillside here that uh, the museum now owns which I am standing at the very upper property line the north property line of what the museum owns um, this was all part of the Wilcox farm so if we look down into the center of town, I mentioned the Holcombs had a hotel. The one that's shown here is not the one. Uh, this was the Lewis Brothers Hotel. This was built after the Holcomb Hotel burned down. The Holcombs uh, ran this from about 1851, the one that was here, from 1851 up until um, they sold it. Um, C. Dwight Holcomb was the... Um, hotel proprietor at that time and he had uh, terrible asthma problems and allergies and um, suffered from it greatly living here in Leroy and he found that if he moved down to the Roaring Branch Ralston area that it actually alleviated it was uh, uh, good for him and his allergies and he was able to breathe better so he closed the hotel and moved down there and he sold the hotel about 1894 or so to uh, a couple by the last name of Ray, R-A-Y, and they ran it for a while. Now the Holcombs had a uh, liquor license, so they they sold liquor in the hotel, but uh, after they sold the hotel, the Rays were unable to get a liquor license, and so a little bit upset, they closed down the hotel and they left town. And mysteriously, sometime later, the hotel burned to the ground. Um, it seems suspicious to me. I think perhaps they uh, were trying to get some insurance money, but it's, it's really a mystery. And then in 1896, the hotel that we know now, 
the, the building that we are looking at in this picture, was built by the Lewis brothers who had started lumbering in the 1880s up on the mountain right up above here that we see starting over to the right of this picture and working their way across the mountain toward Sunfish Pond and around toward Carbon Run as you work your way down to the left there. Um, and as they made money, they built this um, hotel and of course had a general store in there and uh, had um, the the ballroom that went with the hotel the post office was there for a while as well and then a barn was out in the parking area beside it so they sold hay and other provisions to farmers as well so it was kind of a one-stop shop there for anything that you would ever um, possibly need but going back to the ho the uh, Holcombs um, Marlin, who was the one son that was born with Hugh Holcomb's first wife, um, Marlin is the one who, after he was born, his mother died. If you go to the Leroy Cemetery and you look in the middle of the cemetery, there's this the monument that has seashells all over it that Rancy Morris built. And that is built in memory of Elizabeth Oakley Holcomb, who was Hugh Holcomb's first wife. And when she had Marlin, when Marlin was born, uh, she later died of complications after that birth. And uh, Hugh remarried to a woman named Prudence Bailey. Um, and uh, all of the rest of the Holcomb uh, sons and, and so on were came from the second uh, wife. But Marlin was the one who settled right in the center of town. And... Um, uh, right on the uh, spot, he owned the spot that uh, his father uh, had his house, but as far as I'm aware, Marlin, uh, his house was actually across the street. Um, on the corner today is the, the former Leroy General Store, now M&M's Cafe, and then to the right of that is former house built by Melvin and Marlita Colton and then to the right of that is a house that su that supposedly was built by Marlon Holcomb and that is where uh, he lived now Marlon had children and um, when you go then uh, to the right if we move over there's the hotel now we move over here and because the leaves are now in bloom it's hard to see but first of all to the left of the the picture there there's a small house with a red barn behind it and that used to be in most recent past Red Holcomb's house and um, to the right of that is the house that's now owned by Mike and Lisa Miosi and that house where the Miosis live was the house built by Hugh M Holcomb uh, who was a grandson of the original Hugh, and he he built that for he and his wife, oops, when they were married, and then to the left of of his house, what was formerly uh, Red and Jean Holcomb's house in the recent past, uh, that was a general store that was built by Hugh M. Holcomb, and the building was bigger at that time. It extended right out to the sidewalk. When Red Holcomb built the house, he made alterations to it, took the front third of the building off, and made the rest of it his home. So uh, that's Hugh M. Holcomb. Then Hugh M., one of his sons, was Emmett A. Holcomb. And so down uh, the next house is um, the um, Whitehead's house, and that was the, the house built by Hugh M. Holcomb. <laughs> sorry, by Emmett A. Holcomb. I have to keep all the Holcombs straight. And uh, for he and his wife, excuse this tripod, I brought the cheap one because it's easier to handle on a steep hillside. Um, and then Emmett A. Holcomb, one of his sons, 
was Ernest H. Holcomb. And if you skip two houses down, down to here where Ron Kirby now lives, that is Ernest H. Holcomb's house, um, which has beautiful woodwork inside there. And uh, Ernest and his father, Emmett, ran what was the Leroy General store. They were one of the first owners, not the first um, of the store uh, up here on the corner, which was the Oddfellows building. They operated their store out of that location. That building was built by the Oddfellows in 1890. The sign on the front of the store says 1893. That's incorrect. Um, the Oddfellows minutes actually say uh, 1890. But uh, Samuel and Jenny Lloyd were the first ones to operate the store. You can see it just the top of the store sticking up above, above the house there in the foreground. And uh, uh, then Emmett and his son Ernest ran that building um, later on. Up into the 19 teens, 20s era, right across the street, right in the center of this is a old garage built out of blocks. And uh, you can see it's right across Mill Street from the store. And um, originally there was another hotel that sat on that site um, that was operated by the Morse family. And um, this uh, hotel had a ballroom in it, just like the Holcomb Hotel. And then later the Lewis House that we still um, have today. But um, it's the Holcomb Hotel, or the, um, the Morse uh, uh, version of the hotel on the corner there that um, had a ballroom in it, supposedly that had springs under the floor so that when you danced in the ballroom, the floor would jump up and down. Um, that building stood there up until the 1890s when uh, that building burned to the ground and uh, burned some other things to the ground at the same time, uh, including a blacksmith shop nearby. And uh, also a different store was on the corner where, um, the, where the, the Leroy General store later was. That building also burned in the 1890s as well. and. Uh, the current store uh, was built then, so it was about 1890 that that fire happened. And so the Odd Fellows moved in at that time. Now when Emma and Ernest had their store operational on, uh, on the uh, corner there, uh, and that fire happened on the other corner, they looked across the street and saw a business opportunity, and so they purchased that piece of land there and built that tile uh, garage that is there now and used that as a Model T Ford dealership. And so if, when you look at the building, you can see how there were windows across the front and that's because the front was a showroom for new vehicles. And then the back where the garage door is was the service area for those vehicles. So that occurred in the 19 teens that that was built and uh, also gas was sold there, gasoline. There were gas pumps out front. Um, several people still remember gas pumps being there um, uh, well up decades, many, de many decades later. Um, and the, the place was run as a garage for many, many years, even up until the point uh, when I was a child. Um, so that was started by Ernest and Emmett. So if we jump back down, we talked about the Lewis brothers having the hotel here. If we jump back down, we skipped a house down here, right here. And this house was George Lewis's house. Um, George Lewis is one of the Lewis brothers that had the hotel built. George was actually the store owner, or, or the store proprietor, I guess I should say. They all had a partnership in the business. but. Um, we had um, George, Harrison, and Lloyd were the three Lewis brothers. Lloyd wasn't so much involved. He had a farm up the road, but he was he was still connected. And then um, uh, George ran the store. Um, their sister, 
Bertha, along with her husband, um, ran the uh, hotel. And then uh, the other brother, Harrison, who actually lived just up the street. We'll look up here. Can't see it from here, but we'll point in that direction. Through the trees right here, right next to the creek. Uh, uh, Harrison lived in that house down there for a while. But George, as I mentioned, lived up the road. And so there was a gasoline-fired power plant that was in the basement of Lloyd Lewis's house, which was much further up the road, and they ran power lines down to George's house, onto the hotel, and then on to Harrison's house, um, and provided electricity to those buildings um, a couple of decades before the rest of town had electricity. So if you can imagine um, coming into town in the very early um, 1900s, even the late 1800s when it was first built, because we can see they put the knob and tube uh, wiring through when the building was actually built. So um, 1896 it was built and so the electric was done. Um, but they, they put a more elaborate system, I think, in around 1911 to provide that electricity. And so um, you can imagine coming to town at that time when everyone else has just candle lights and oil lamps and things and seeing these houses lit up with um, electricity, especially the hotel. Um, it, it probably was... A pretty amazing sight to behold when you had never seen electric lights in this valley before. So that's a pretty pretty interesting thing we take for granted uh, probably today. So we've talked about basically what's along uh, Main Street at least within the area that we can see from this location. So we'll talk a little bit uh, about Mill Street uh, some of the earliest houses down on Mill Street were the smaller sized houses that some of which are still there and you can uh, see them today although they're greatly altered from their original state and um, they are there's a, some story and a half style houses on Mill Street and so those are some of the older style ones um, On the right side of Mill Street, as you're heading south on Mill Street, um, there are two churches and then a house in between the churches we'll talk about. Um, the first church is the Church of Christ. It was built in 1849 on that spot, um, just the sanctuary. And uh, what we look at today, we when you look at it, you see a belfry and you see a, a foyer area that was added on the front. That was not there in 1849. That was added in an 1890s renovation. So all you would see is just a rectangular building with a belfry on top of the main roof. Uh, that belfry was taken off and the current one added um, again in the 1890s renovation. And then uh, uh, an addition was added on to the back of that church in, um, I assume, about the, eight, the 1920s or that era. That seems about, about accurate. Um, we've never been able to find records um, as far as that church goes, and so it's really hard to, to know exactly. But um, uh, that church property was given um, by Marlon Holcomb, who I mentioned before, so he gave he gave property there to the the church because he was a member of that church when Hugh Holcomb um, was here in the 1830s. He uh, invited a, a minister to come to town. Previous to that, Hugh Holcomb had been a member of the Baptist Church in town here, but he invited a member of the Church of Christ. Um, in Canton to come down and preach here and he came down and as the story goes he preached for five hours without any interruption and everyone sat and listened 
And as a result of that service, Hugh and Marlon and Marlon's wife uh, left the Baptist church, went to start the Church of Christ up the street. And that is why Marlon gave that land to the Church of Christ so that building could be built. Now the Baptist Church is the one you can see in the photo, in the image here, to the right with uh, the windows in it. The belfry's gone now. Um, the Baptist Church was talking about building a building at the time that the Church of Christ already had built theirs, but they didn't quite have the money together yet to be able to do it. So it wasn't, up, it wasn't until 1855 that the Baptist Church uh, uh, there was built. Now again, that building looks completely different than what you see there today. It didn't have stained glass windows in it when it was built in 1855. The belfry, which of course has been long gone now, but uh, even the belfry that most people remember that was there uh, was not the original belfry when um, the um, church was first built. The original belfry, belfry almost looked as if it was some sort of a uh, top of a castle or something. It was a very unusual looking top to it, but it was rebuilt at um, in, in the 1890s when a lot of the other renovations were going on in town. The Baptist Church also did their major uh, renovation at the same time and overhauled their building, so they built a new belfry at that time. The Baptist Church had two different doors going into the front of it, um, as many of them did uh, back at that time, and so um, it wasn't necessarily for women and men to be separated. Uh, it was just a uh, de uh, design of that particular time for those buildings. In fact, there were two different aisles up the middle when you walked into that church back then, and instead of having two different sets of pews, one on each side of a center aisle, you had three different sets of pews, and then two aisles running up through. Of course there was a choir loft in the back and uh, those things were all removed um, in the 1890s renovation. Uh, another thing done in the 1890s renovation was that the stained glass windows were put in down there and uh, the, the windows came from another church. They have signs of having been through a fire but um, we've searched and searched and searched and just cannot figure out where they got them from. There's newspaper accounts of them being installed, but there uh, is no reference in the records or anywhere as to where they got the uh, windows from. We followed up at uh, in various locations, but just haven't been able to come across an answer to that question. Of course, the belfry was taken off around 1950 or so, um, had problems with bats and, and um, the, an addition was added on to the um, the back of the church, um, which you can see just barely read it right above the hotel roof there, about 1950. The church there had received funding um, as a result of a trust left from the Lamb family. The Lamb family had owned the store that I mentioned up on the corner that had burned down and then the Odd Fellows later bought that lot and built this current building. The Lamb family owned that store that burned, and so they had been in town for many years. Charles H. Lamb was the, the father, and um, they were uh, from a long line of Baptists, the Lamb family, came over from the Troy area. And uh, Charles H. Lamb was um, one of the trustees at the time that the church acquired that piece of property from the Harris family who had at that time a sawmill right down the street where the community grounds is. The Harrises were members of the Baptist Church and but Charles L. Lamb who was the son of Charles H. Um, had left money to the church. Charles L. Lamb had grown up in Leroy and he had um, gone off, become an attorney. He had moved out to Minneapolis and to make a long story short he bought up a lot of land around Minneapolis before the city expanded and when the city uh, started to grow he began selling off land in lots to people looking to move into the area 
and so as a result he became quite wealthy from both that and also his career as an attorney. And so when he died, having not married, having no children, he basically left all of his money to um, organizations both in Leroy and out in Minneapolis. Um, uh, he was attending a church out there. He left money to that church. I believe it was called St. Mark's Church. And then here in Leroy, he left money to the Odd Fellows, and he left money to the, the Baptist Church and to the cemetery as well, Leroy Cemetery, where the Lamb Monument you can see today. It's the largest monument when you pass the cemetery. It says Lamb on it. And uh, he left a great deal of money to, to have that um, installed there. So that's a little overview of the Baptist Church. Um, I think I mentioned that uh, an addition was added onto the church in 1950. Um, another addition was added on in 1980, which is really what you're looking at in the picture. Um, uh, a fellowship hall and Sunday school rooms. So 1980 is uh, when the church really got to its final form that we've been accustomed to for many years. Now in between the church I mentioned there was a house and if we look at it you can see the roof sticking up between the two churches just slightly. It's kind of a tannish brownish roof and that was a schoolhouse that actually sat right up the road and if we look we see the house that Dr. Wilcox built and then over to the left of that is a driveway running back to the Peters house. And right about where that driveway is, there used to be a schoolhouse that sat there. And that building is now right there in between the churches. Now the, the uh, deal with that is that was called the center school. And that is where any child living in basically downtown Leroy went to school there back in the... Um, starting in uh, about 1835 and um, even before that actually but 1835 is when the township was formed so that they could start their own school system and so um, school was held there until 1894 when they outgrew it they built a new school down just uh, down the road to the left of this video picture and it was um, a two-story school, which the building is still down there now, sat on the Bob Chilson um, property. And um, again, still is there today. So um, the uh, school down between the churches, when it had closed, where it was up in this location, um, it was put on logs, hooked up to oxen, and the oxen pulled it down Mill Street and pulled it in between the churches where it was put on a foundation there and became a house. And so as you look at the building, the back of the house as it is now used to be the front of the schoolhouse because they hooked on to the front of the school when they went to pull it across the street and down onto Mill Street. The, fa the end of the house that faces out toward uh, Mill Street is the back of the school. And, uh, but a, the, the pitch on the roof was raised up quite a bit. It was not so high originally. Um, but we're talking now in the 1890s. We're in the Victorian era and steep roofs were popular. And so a steep roof was added and then a second floor then was able to be put on uh, in that house. The porch was added to the front and then that became a house. Um, at one point it was used as a parsonage for the Church of Christ back in, in the early um, 1900s era, um, but for the most part um, it was just a, a regular residence from then on. The telephone company for Leroy was in there at one time. And so there it is sitting today as one of Leroy's first schoolhouses. And also, because it was the schoolhouse, the churches also had their meetings there. And um, were um, a lot of people 
uh, came to that that schoolhouse for town meetings and um, speeches for political purposes and so on. So it was used for a number of of uh, reasons. Why we're on the the topic of schools. Back in the early 1800s, when the center school was operating uh, down here that I mentioned, there was also a school directly on the opposite side of the creek, right at the intersection of Southside Road and Mill Street. And so you can see there now, um, in the center of the picture, is uh, kind of a, a double wide house and then a, a barn with a red, a red uh, second floor on it. Right on that corner was a building. It burned down um, within my lifetime, and uh, it was called the Bell School, and that was another one-room school. So any child living in the center of Leroy who lived on the south side of the Tawanda Creek went to the Bell School. So any of these houses up and down Southside Road for about a mile and a half, which is the limit that um, children were allowed to walk to school in those days. Um, all of those kids went to the Bell School. It was called the Bell School because the, the parents who sent their children to school there all got together and raised money to purchase a bell um, for that school. And of course the bell was, was rung every day to um, to notify uh, the kids that school was about to start. Now, when that school closed, uh, it was in the 1890s when I said the two-story center school was closed. Um, the, the Bell School and the little one-room school here in the center of town both closed at the same time, and all of those kids were sent to the center school. And so... When that happened, the bell was taken out of the bell school and moved over to the two-story center schoolhouse where it remained until that school closed, which was in 1929, 30, 1929. And uh, that is when the school right here in this photo was built, 1930. It opened in 1930. And that is the Leroy Consolidated School. So when the school classes moved over to this one, the bell was moved to this location as well and was put right up in the, um, the top there. There's a little belfry on top. And uh, in later years, the uh, community association took the bell out. Um, but in more recent years, it has been put back. And so that bell is now today in that little belfry inside the community building. So that's had a long life. It's moved all over town uh, in the course of time. And uh, so we'll talk now a little bit about that property that the school is on. But it, it actually begins with the Grange, oops, sorry, the Grange property which is behind the trees. To, uh, on the other side of the Baptist Church there is um, the house that's currently owned by Pat Bailey. And then on the other side of that is what used to be the Grange Hall, which is now the Roy Heritage Museum. Now, back in um, the earlier uh, days, the house that the Baileys own uh, was the Harris's house built by Amos Harris and the Harris's owned where the Grange Hall was they owned that whole property where the schoolhouse uh, is and they operated their sawmill um, there on that location um, and then um, they sold um, at a very reasonable cost to the Grange members who were looking to start um, to build their own building and um, so in 1876 is when the uh, Grange uh, built their building on that site right there. And so the Grange actually owned most of the uh, community grounds, what is considered the community grounds now that you see in the picture there. Um, the schoolhouse, which is a community building, and the uh, ball field area 
Um, it was all originally part of the Grange, uh, a portion of it anyway. Um, and then what wasn't part of the Grange, all of these houses along Main Street extended down almost all the way to the Grange property line and all of these properties extended all the way down which meant that all of these people along Main Street used to have more land but when the school moved into that location they uh, um, basically by eminent eminent domain they took over um, what land they needed for the school grounds and that is where the ball field is today and that is how the Grange basically lost a lot of its land as well the school took um, took a big piece there and so the Grange lot basically was left with a, a, just a small uh, portion but with the understanding that the Grange and the school would share the driveway which is something that has extended all the way up till today where the museum and the community grounds share the driveway um, the ball field I should mention if you go back many years to the beginning of Leroy back into the days when Hugh Holcomb was settled here um, uh, another of um, the Holcombs was Alphys Holcomb he was a brother of Hugh he also came from Ulster and he settled here briefly but then he moved on down down the uh, creek and um, settled at a different location later and um, the uh, area that's now the ball field was an apple orchard that was planted by Alphys Holcomb back in the very early um, part of the 1800s and many people remember that apple orchard uh, even uh, leading up to uh, probably the late 1800s Rancy Morse remembered as a child that the apple orchard was there and he remembered um, going there and uh, getting apples off the trees um, that apple orchard um, uh, later basically disappeared um, a little bit at a time until it was no longer there so the site where the community grounds is and um, the schoolhouse specifically below that was an area where there was a um, a water a race there was a mill and then out behind the school was a mill pond, which you can't see, but through the trees there was a mill pond that collected water from the Tawanda Creek in order to power the water-powered mill that was located in that location. And the mill was an up-and-down sawmill, uh, you referred to it as, and an up-and-down sawmill basically is one long saw blade that just is pulled up and down to saw a piece of lumber and it usually it's operated by water power and um, that um, operated in that location for quite a while in fact there were more than one mill in in there was more than one mill in Leroy but um, and they all operated by the up and down saw blade method but the water power was never good enough and so they all switched over to circular saws eventually using steam powered mills and that's that's basically what eventually happened at, at this location um, and then Rancy Morse um, owned a piece of property about where that pavilion is and uh, he had a planing mill um, approximately in, in, right where that um, pavilion is and it was in the planing mill there that the Lewis brothers brought their um, uh, lumber from off the mountain that they needed for their trim work and so on and had it planed and finished in that mill and then brought up here to the hotel to be put into place so it was uh, produced in Rancy Morse's planing mill um, that was down there of course running through this whole picture here was the um, pv &E Railroad, the railroad that was being built but was never finished. And you can see where it was as you follow those that line of trees right through here. 
and um, it ran right behind where the schoolhouse building uh, now is. Of course, the school wasn't there at that time, but um, part of the uh, embankment there that the school sits on was originally the railroad bed, and then it ran out right out uh, through where the driveway now is, and then crossed um, the Mill Street and continued on through the valley. So we, f we did find that um, uh, there was a reference of a railroad depot being built, and it was actually going to be right through the trees right here, right next door to the Grange Hall, and it was gonna be in the lawn right there, uh, what what is the lawn now and a foundation was reported to have been built in 1907 but coincidentally that was also the same year that the railroad went bankrupt and um, the whole thing died right there and so the rails never were quite finished and the railroad never ran through Leroy unfortunately um, from this location you can also see uh, right up on the mountain and you can see the uh, mountain road heading up there now uh, when the PB&E railroad was in operation there was talk by the Barclay Railroad of running a line that would come across the mountain and come down that mountain at an angle I, I can't even imagine the engineering to get a railroad to come down uh, at an angle down that mountain but they were going to run a line down into Leroy and uh, uh, hook it to a railroad that they said they were going to build through the valley because basically the, the Barclay Railroad didn't want competition from this newly formed PB&E railroad and so uh, they went up and down through the valley the Barclay Railroad did and bought up right-of-way from all of these different properties and uh, eventually when the Barclay Railroad went defunct, they uh, sold their um, right-of-way to the PB&E. Of course, the PB&E went defunct, and so um, it never it never worked out anyway. Um, when you look at the the mountainside here, running up through the center of the of the picture, there is the mountain road. Now, there was no a road in that location up on on the mountain originally um, the way to get on the mountain was to have gone if, if you turn right at that intersection shown in the picture the intersection of Southside Road and Mill Street um, uh, today if you turn left at that location you continue on up over the hill and down the other side and you come uh, almost to the um, the, or you come to the Christ farm there there was a road and still is in fact that runs up over the mountainside and has switchbacks that run back and forth all the way to the top and it comes out right almost at the top um, as you drive up today um, it comes out just below the road there and that was the way that people got up onto the mountain from this location prior to the 1870s now the purpose for getting up there of course was that Barclay had been started and Carbon Run um, was eventually started and there were ways to uh, there was reasons for business purposes of course to get up there um, to Barclay and for Barclay people to get down here it just was kind of a treacherous trip to be able to do that now Hugh M. Holcomb who I mentioned that had the uh, store in the house right down below for mind you right down here next right across the highway here. He wanted to um, have a coal trade, and so he bought some, some mines up at Carbon Run, and he had to get um, that coal down off the mountain to be able to sell it down here. The problem is it was too difficult to get loads of coal uh, that were in wagons pulled by horses down the switchbacks um, further on down the road. Um, further on down the valley so he went to work and built this road that you see in the center of the picture that goes up over the mountain and goes all the way um, the part he built anyway goes all the way to carbon run 
and that was why that road was originally built. So, so that Hugh M. Holcomb could get the coal from the mines at Carbon Run down off the mountain and down here to his store to sell it in Leroy. Um, of course, later on, it was it was extended greatly. Um, in many years later, when Sunfish Pond um, started to be used, and Sunfish Pond was being used in the 1800s, only not on any official basis. People just went up there for... Um, picnics and so on um, if um, those people wanted to get up there that was the way um, that they got there from down here um, in those years of course over the years as um, things developed on the mountain more mining was done the Mott's that lived down here Wesley Mott who had uh, the house that Hugh M. Holcomb later or uh, earlier had lived in um, Wesley had the coal brought down off the mountain to the scales that were down here next to Hugh M. Holcomb's old store and um, that was um, used and weighed here uh, so people could buy their coal. So he made use of that road um, as well. But when the Civilian Conservation Corps came through, which was uh, around the similar uh, similar and same time, um, they started rebuilding and building new roads across the mountain as part of the work that they did um, during the depression and so the use of the mountain grew and of course eventually way up into the 1970s then we had the the uh, sunfish pond started to be developed and and uh, so now that road up onto the mountain is is a very important connection to a lot of things that go on not only at Sunfish but also the game lands and then across the mountain uh, to a number of cabins and so on. So that's a quick overview of what that that road is all about. So uh, we've probably been going quite a while so I'm going to wrap this up pretty quickly. Um, uh, the South Side Road I'll just sort of highlight some of the things going on on the South Side Road. Now, Hugh Holcomb, I mentioned he had a son, Marlon, um, but when he remarried to his second wife, Prudence, she had several more sons, and um, they each received a piece of their father's estate over the years as they grew up. Now, if we back up a little bit and understand something, first of all, when, when Hugh and Sterling, the two brothers, first came here, um, they bought up this entire valley. And so the part that Hugh Holcomb owned began uh, on the east side uh, with where Mill Street now is. That was the basic approximate dividing line, and that was the west or the, I should say the east uh, border of Hugh Holcomb's property. He then owned 400 acres and extended from basically up where I am all the way across to the valley to the, to the um, uh, mountains on the other side and then a little, uh, quite a ways up the valley here to a point where there was a line and then Sterling Holcomb's property started and he owned another 400 acres. And... Uh, they made the money to buy this land by selling uh, animal pelts. And um, so that was how that all came together. So as a result, Hugh owned quite a bit of property. And so when it came time for his sons to receive property when they grew up, he d divided it up and gave them each a section. Now the first property here, which is now the Tomlinson Farm, that has been in the Tomlinson family going uh, back into the late 1800s, um, that was owned by a number of different um, people um, over the years, uh, uh, not uh, necessarily by the Holcombs until you get way back into the beginning. It's when you move down the valley to the next farm, which is right here, and currently this is Randy and Kay Morse's farm, and 
that was Alonzo uh, Morris's, Alonzo Holcomb's um, farm. Alonzo was a son, one of the sons of Hugh. Alonzo was my fourth great grandfather. Um, he had his family there, and uh, the house was much different at the time than what it looks like now. But uh, Alonzo uh, is the guy who uh, was gored to death by a, a bull right there on that property. Um, he, uh, the quick story of that is that he came out to walk down here to downtown Leroy one day, and he went to cross the field that you see through the trees there. You can see Southside Road. Below that is a pasture leading over into where the Tomlinson's pasture is through the trees over there. So basically, instead of walking up the road um, and following that down, he took a shortcut through a pasture, uh, which is still a pasture. Um, and in the process of crossing through there, um, he had a bull tied to a stake out in the field and uh, decided that while he was walking through, he was going to move that bull to a different part of the pasture. So he went over and he pulled up the stake and in the process of doing that, the bull turned on him, attacked him, and gored him to death. And the family didn't know anything about it until the bull came back to uh, the house, came running by the house, and had pieces of Alonzo's clothing and uh, his blood um, hanging from the top of his head. And so um, Alonzo basically was torn apart, which... Uh, uh, kind of terrible thing to talk about, but that is what happened. It was he was totally unrecognizable by the time this bull was done. So that was a rather sad story. He had a son and a daughter. His son was Pearson Holcomb. Pearson would later be a Civil War soldier, and Pearson is my third great grandfather. Yeah. Um, so that's the first farm there. That was Hugh Holcomb's son Alonzo and then the next one uh, the next one down which was um, the the current house was built by um, uh, Red Holcomb's family and uh, uh, the Holcombs lived over there but prior to that there was a different house there uh, many years before and um, Another son of Hugh lived in that location. I believe it was Cyrus, if I'm correct, uh, lived in that location. And then continuing on down, we get into trees where you can't see. But you see there's a um, kind of a hedgerow that comes down through um, over there. And that continues on down to the road. There's a creek that runs through the trees over there and goes under the road and uh, right now there's a hunting uh, hunting camp there but there was a house there uh, up until the 1990s the house burned down um, but that uh, was the location originally I believe that was Orders Farm if I'm not mistaken and um, in later years that was Jay uh, Jasper Holcomb's uh, farm which is Red Holcomb's uh, relative so um, the house that was on that location that burned down was built by Jasper Holcomb. That wasn't the original one either. And then uh, I, th I believe moving on down, there were others that, that Hugh Holcomb gave out to some of his family as well. So that's just kind of an interesting way in which this valley was all divided up. Remember I said on this side was Marlon and his descendants, basically. And on the other side were all of the other sons who came from the second wife, um, and that was how that was put together. On this side of the, the uh, Tawanda Creek, to the left, or to the east of Mill Street, um, you had property that was owned primarily by the Morse family, and that was where the Morses came, which, who were other early settlers of the town. And they came in 1805 down to the area that uh, is in more recent years known as, was known as Vaughn and Zelma Jennings uh, Farm. And um, the Morses came to that property in 1805. 
um, built a log house there. Jesse Morse was the first settler, brought his family. His son, Pearlie, grew up, took over the farm, and he built the house that's there now. And he built that in 1826. It once had additions on it. There was a tavern in it and uh, rooms uh, as well as a ballroom that uh, was used. And so the early settlers of Leroy and, and visitors to the area as they came through town, um, if they were traveling, they would stop there at the Morse Tavern. Uh, you could get uh, a drink there. You could stay the night there if you needed to. You could get uh, something uh, if you needed something for your horse, your horse to be fed, or you needed new shoes on the horse or something, it could all be done at that um, location down there. You can't see it from here, unfortunately. It's uh, through the trees. And um, so that was the Morse Tavern, and the Morse family owned a good portion of that part of the valley. In the early days when the Morse family was there, um, the um, early military training, um, which was a once a year thing. Um, everyone had to, of a certain age, had to report to the Morse farm, um, which had a large flat area. And uh, you reported there for military training in case uh, something occurred and you had to be called to serve. That was in the very early uh, 1800s. And so that uh, farm is, is very historic for those reasons and, and many others as well. Um, and on the back side of the Tawanda Creek, almost on the opposite side from where the Morse family owned, um, we had the Mott family. Now the Mott family farmhouse is through the trees right there. There's a gas pad up behind it now. And um, the Motts didn't come until uh, the 1850s. But there was another house there on this, this site um, before that. Um, but the Mott's came in the 1850s and then have, have been connected with Leroy ever since. And so the Mott farmhouse um, became owned by them uh, at that time. It was originally, as I said in the past, it was another one of those story and a half houses. It was not until later um, times that Thomas Mott, uh, a son of the original Mott, Matthew Mott, uh, Thomas rebuilt the house into a two-story house and made it look as it does today, except that it also had a front porch across it. Um, but he was the one that, that had done that. Um, the Mott's had a tannery. Matthew Mott was a tanner. And so up behind, you can just barely see through the trees, there's a top of a silo looking through the trees there, and you can see... Um, that there is a barn there and uh, there was a tannery in that barn originally and then it, in, the, in later years that became a farm, a farm uh, uh, barn for storing hay and, and then cattle in the basement and so on. And so that started out as a tanner, a tannery and uh, when you needed to have a pair of shoes made um, you would go over there with your animal hides to the tannery. You would have your a leather made there in the tannery. You'd then pick it up and you would bring it back over town here where you would go to the shoemaker shop and you would have your shoes made to fit um, here in the shoemaker shop in town. And that's how you had shoes back in those days. Now in later years the Mott's and the McCraney's got together and they also had a, a slaughterhouse on this property and uh, they slaughtered um, uh, a number of head of, of, uh, of uh, cattle here every week because especially during the, um, the days when Lakewind was in operation, the lumber town upon the mountain above here, um, the Lakewind store required uh, several heads of, of uh, beef um, every week to uh, feed the people of the town. And so that was cut and uh, all done up right down here in Leroy. And then it was loaded up on wagons and taken up over to Laquin and delivered to the store there. And so the Mott and McCraney family had quite an operation 
uh, going on there um, during the time that Lakeland was was going, uh, particularly in the early days of Lakeland. If you uh, if you look over the land that's shown in the picture, a lot of it was the Mott's land. Now up through the up along Southside Road there, there was originally several different properties. And if you look at the old maps and and so on, you find that there were many other buildings, houses, and so on up through there. And there were hedgerows that that separated those properties. Some of the hedgerows are still there. Others have been taken out. Uh, I remember some that were there that have been taken out in my lifetime. Um, but the most important thing is looking over to the side and the Mott Cemetery is, is located there. Now, uh, the Mott Cemetery was um, started when the, around the time that the Mott's first came uh, to this area. One of the earliest burials is from that time. And then over the years, it has been used by the Mott, Mott family ever since. Um, not everyone in there is necessarily um, a Mott. There are a couple that aren't quite. Dr. Wilcox, in fact, um, I'm not sure if he had a connection. As far as I know, he didn't. But Dr. Wilcox um, is buried up there that I mentioned previously that lived here in the center of town. Um, but various uh, branches of the Mott family um, are buried there. In fact, uh, Pearson that I mentioned, whose father Alonzo was gored by the bull, Pearson and his wife, Sophia, who are my third great grandparents, are buried there in the Mott Cemetery. And um, But there are other branches of the Mott family that are buried there as well. And I would say probably, uh, uh, mostly, probably uh, um, the um, descendants from Matthew Mott's second wife, I would say, are more often buried there. Um, a lot of the others were buried in, um, in other locations, but that's not always the case. Some of them were buried there. Now, in most recent years, the Mott Cemetery has been expanded. So if you look closely, you can see different colors of grass there because um, the cemetery has um, acquired additional land, which was something set out in their original charter that they would be able to acquire additional land in the future. And so they have gone ahead and done that and um, have uh, uh, worked on um, cleaning that up and uh, moving fences and so on to encompass that entire um, cemetery. So the, the cemetery will be, will be much larger when that is all said and done and um, will be open um, for burials into the future. And so they've done a great deal of work to that cemetery. So basically, that is a an overview of the town of Leroy. There's certainly a whole lot more that could be told. One thing that comes to mind I forgot that I will tell is that the hotel that you're seeing in the lower part of the picture, the one built by the Lewises, um, it operated with water that came from a well house that was up here on the um, side hill. In fact, up behind me, there is a foundation. It's on private property. It's off the museum property. And uh, there was a basically a well house there. And water was gathered there and was piped down over the hill to um, in between the... Um, hotel and then the Dr. Wilcox's house to the left of that and uh, it hooked up the hotel and several houses here on Main Street and um, let's see a couple basically the Holcombs Rancy Morse when he had his Rancy owned the hotel that burned on the corner down there so he was included and at that time um, Dr. Haynes, Charles A. Haynes, had built a house, and that house is still down here right along the creek. 
uh, right running through the center of town. And uh, all of those houses were to be on a water system, and the water would be fed from up above here, a, a basically a cistern that collected the water and sent it down over the hill, and all of the people who were getting the water from it were paying into it uh, individually in order to uh, maintain that service. That service In the basement of the hotel, there's still a pipe that comes through the, the wall, and it's capped off now. That, uh, that pipe came down over the hill and came into the basement there where it was, uh, was hooked up for use. And uh, this was done around the time the hotel was built in 1896. And um, most of, uh, a lot of the people here, I should say, not most, but a lot of the people on Main Street operated their homes with water that came out of this um, the uh, home of Charles Haynes, however, before this system got up and operating, um, the rest of the people who were getting, who were to get water from the system, decided to cut Charles Haynes out of it because Charles Haynes had made an indecent joke about um, the local blacksmith's wife, and uh, they thought that was totally uncalled for. And so they wrote very strong language in the paperwork when they formed the water company, stating that never at any time would Dr. Charles Haynes receive any water from this system. So Dr. Haynes kind of cut his throat on that situation. But uh, just kind of a, a funny story that uh, I found along the way. So somewhere buried underground here, running down over this hillside, is... Um, a pipeline that was put in and um, uh, in order to feed the water down along the, the main street here. So anyway, as I said, that is a, a brief overview, probably not so brief by this point, of um, downtown Leroy and some of the history behind it, why it is the way it is, how it's set up here. I'm sure there's other things I could have said and um, and didn't say, but um, uh, one more thing I I will say as well, and then I promise to quit. And that is the house in the picture right there, which I neglected to mention. Speaking of the blacksmith, is what brought this to mind. Um, that house was was built by uh, Holdsworth. Joseph Holtzworth, who was the blacksmith. He was the last blacksmith for Leroy. There was a blacksmith shop that sat about where the driveway for that house is, right? There's a van parked there right now. And uh, there was a blacksmith shop there, and that blacksmith shop burned down when the hotel on the corner burned down in the 1890s. So Joseph Holtzworth came in there. He built a new blacksmith shop, and... Um, uh, he built that house, and uh, Frank Bailey, who was the guy who lived just a few doors down on Mill Street, Frank was a carpenter. He had helped build many barns and houses in town. He oversaw the building of the Open and Grange building. Uh, Frank built this house as well, and um, because of this it's kind of the weird uh, design of the house and the roof line just wasn't coming out right, and so Mr. Holtzworth went to uh, uh, Frank and said um, that he can't figure out how to, to build this roof and how to make it all come together. And Frank had the solution, and that was to put a flat top on the roof, and then uh, you can run the roof line up to the top of the roof uh, from there. So if you look closely, you can see there's a flat top on on that roof, which it's hard to see from the ground, um, but that was because uh, Holtzworth had designed his house and didn't quite know how to put a roof over everything he had designed. So anyway, that's, uh, that was an interesting story as well. So I hope you've enjoyed just a little bit of background history on this um, beautiful day, and uh, hopefully you've learned a little bit about downtown Leroy and exactly how it all came together. So thank you very much for joining me and see you next time.